Well, good morning and welcome to you all across Canada to join us for the Alberta version of the Campfire Chat. It's uh, exciting to be here. My name is Greg Snyder. I'm a plan giving consultant with the Donor Motivation Program in Calgary. And most importantly, I'd like to invite you to uh, meet my guest of today. Anna Scott, who's the manager and fund development of events and for Alberta Adolescent Recovery Center here in Calgary. Good morning. Um, and this organization that Anna's part of, I think is a vital one, um, treating addiction, you know, as a chronic disease. Uh, and that they focus primarily on adolescents and of course their families and trying to find solutions so they can become more productive and feel good about themselves as the world goes forward. Um, it's important work that they do this. And I'm going to note this, they do this without any significant government funding, which in the world of fundraising creates a whole bunch of additional challenges. So Anna, how, how would you like to tell me a little bit about how you managed to get into the not-for-profit center sector and, <laughs> and uh, why did you join in with ARC? Well, sure. It's uh, It's been an interesting journey. Um, I've spent about 13 cumulative years in the nonprofit sector. Um, I, uh, I did a Master's of Fine Arts at the University of Regina and consequently started working at a small nonprofit art gallery in that city. Um, worked there for seven years. Um, took some time off to run my own business and uh, then came to Calgary and uh, wound up back in the nonprofit sector. So yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's been a sort of a meandering road. I don't have formal training in fund development or fundraising, but I've always wanted to um, make a difference in people's lives. And so that's what's really driven my desire to work in nonprofit. Yeah, I think when we talked earlier, um, you, you mentioned me, you said it wasn't an aspiration of yours when you started out to become a, a fundraising professional, um, but the fact that you want to make a difference and took steps to back that up, uh, from my point of view, and I'm sure many on the call, that is aspirational on its own, and, and thank you for making that path. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit. This is a campfire chat format, and it's 20 below zero, I think, roughly in Calgary this morning. We just had six inches of snow, um, so my deck campfire is just not working. I'm by the fireplace, which may or may not turn on uh, shortly. Um, but campfire chats are kind of a special thing. It's much like the religious process of breaking bread, of gathering around a place and having a conversation about what's important to you and what's going on in your life and, and how it affects things. Um, today, um, this, is a, this is our form of it, and we hope that we bring some value to you. We hope you have a little bit of fun. And there's a, a thought that goes to my mind here too. When you're around campfires, one of the traditions we started with this program was to celebrate the fact that there's usually some sort of a drink or a celebratory cocktail or so on that we get involved with when we're, when we're uh, uh, sitting around the campfire. And the end result of that is, well, this, this is kind of awkward because it's nine o'clock in the morning in Calgary and, and we're dealing with a program that uh, is on a recovery process about <laughs> recovery. So we're going, how do we introduce, uh, you know, potentially alcoholic al beverages at this point? So, uh, Anna, I know you have something that uh, is suitable that you're I do. Tell us a little bit about it. So what I've got today is cold brewed coffee. Um, it's a way that I love to make coffee uh, because it's turns out less acidic. Um, you just start it the night before, put coffee and water in a jar and then strain it out and add whatever accoutrements you'd like to it. Um, and uh, then you have a lovely cold coffee drink on a cold day. I'm a little bit odd in that I drink cold coffee year round. Um, but uh, certainly in the summer, it's a beautiful way to make iced coffee. Super. And I and my hats off to that. Now, I'm going to say I'm breaking the rules a little bit uh, relative to the organization, but I was told that we were allowed. And I'm also going with the coffee drink. And mine has a bit of a history, it goes back to when my family, and I was quite young, we moved our businesses from Calgary and Toronto to the Lake of the Woods area, Northern Ontario. 
And it was a very stressful time. It was a very exciting time. And we lived in little houses by the lake, which today is probably way too expensive to own. But uh, it was a fabulous place to be there. And we created a coffee drink we called the Kenora Coffee. And its uh, main ingredient is uh, a mixture of 50% amaretto, a 50% cognac or brandy of your choosing. Um, top it with some nice dark roast. And ideally with whipped cream and a drizzle of amaretto on the top. Um, in this case, I'm getting a little older. They tell me not to have as much sugar. So I foregoed the whipped cream and used the foamed uh, latte foam instead. Um, it's a delightful drink to share stories around, uh, around the campfire. And um, so Kenora didn't know it had a coffee named after it, but <laughs> it's to it. Um, now, not to dwell on the campfire concept, but you know, all of us have a camping experience. That's something interesting and so on. And you shared that your husband and you are rel relatively unique in seeking out your campfire experiences. Uh, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, my husband and I typically camp at uh, outdoor festivals. So electronic music festivals. Um, the one that people might have heard of the most um, in this chat is Burning Man. Um, we, uh, we love to go to um, just these really creative festivals, see the art, meet the, meet the people. And um, when we've gone there, it's uh, definitely um, fire has been a big part of um, how we connect with people, just sitting around somebody's campfire or a piece of art that's got uh, some flames coming from it and uh, just really sharing that human connection. That's terrific. I, I have not been to um, Burning Man or that's the one you hear about in the news uh, and uh, the great, great crowds that arrive and so on. Um, my wife, who I've been married to for the last 25 years, um, she came from the Philippines and campfires to her were how they cooked their food every day. So it doesn't really uh, invoke her ideas. Let's go camping and live in a tent or live in, uh, in a, uh, you know, some sort of nature surrounding. She said uh, she enjoys the hotels and uh, five stars much better. Um, seems to, seems to fit her style. So my camping has changed over the years and I can't say I'm complaining too much, but we do enjoy uh, gathering around fire. It is therapeutic at least, at the least you can say. Now, you know, we've been recovering, and I, I'm saying this truly, we've been recovering from being locked down through the pandemic of the last year. And, and, and still, as we all know, across the country, we're still in that process. And that's created some challenges and some opportunities for the not-for-profit sector to, to try and rejig a little bit and succeed. So what's actually happened in your world, Anna? Um, well, as probably as the case with most organizations, when the pandemic hit and everything shut down, um, there was a bit of a panic, um, <laughs> not only in fundraising, but in, uh, in all the operations of all organizations. Um, because uh, we had to move very quickly um, at, uh, at ARC to, um, to become a fully residential treatment center. Um, normally the kids go home to recovery homes at night, but um, in the early days of the pandemic, um, it, was, it was deemed a risk to do that um, for the kids to um, be exposed to COVID potentially. Um, and so we pivoted and uh, not only did we have to change our treatment model temporarily, but we had a fundraising gala that was coming up in May. And at first, of course, we were thinking, oh, okay, well, this is gonna only last for a few weeks, then we'll be back to normal. We can have the gala as normal. But then as the pandemic went on, it became evident that we were going to be unable to do that. Um, so we had to, cancel um, the fundraising event. Um, fortunately, we hadn't spent um, a ton of money on it. So we were able to get some of our deposits back and, uh, and whatnot. Um, and at that point, we just thought, okay, like we have to reach out to our donors and let them know what's going on. Um, 
but before we even did that, we had people calling and saying, okay, what's going on? What are you guys doing? Um, how can I help? And that was just a really wonderful thing to see is the community just stepping up, helping to keep the doors open with our increased costs um, and our decreased fundraising. And uh, what we saw was just people just came together and um, wanted to ask not only how can we help ARC, but having personal conversations with these people, how are you doing personally? And we would have the conversations with them and say, well, how are you doing? I know you run a restaurant, so how's that going for you? And that, uh, that sense of human connection was so important in the early days of the pandemic, and it continues to be. Absolutely. And, and I think you shared with me, you know, you had some heroes that just stepped forward to make up much of the gap that you saw from losing your main, one of your main fundraising capabilities. Now, your organization, interesting enough, uh, I view the, the challenges you must have would be larger because your organization was primarily based on events, events fundraising. And, and of course, the, the core donors, many of which had been affected by the affected by the, uh, the program you provide or helped by the program you provide made a difference in their family. So they're a vested interest in making sure you stayed whole. Um, now, naturally, I'd expect you took advantage of all the whatever COVID grants and things were available. Absolutely. To support. Um, that, you know, thank goodness that that uh, was out there. But, you know, one of the challenges you have in this is we were talking a little bit about it is that in the first year, as you go into this, your people are coming to you, they're rising up and saying, okay, we know you're in a trouble. Nobody saw this coming. We hope this isn't lasting forever. Um, and forever seems to be coming as we, we, we rounded the year here. Um, they made a difference for you. Uh, what's your concerns about this year? Because as time goes on and the COVID fatigue is set in and you know, the people have tried to adapt with their own issues of how to run their own lives. How do you see yourself, you know, connecting this year? Um, or, or what do you think your concerns are about, about doing that? Well, um, my concern for this year and even extending into last year, um, going into the holiday season, is that uh, people, as you said, have pandemic fatigue. Um, and that means the donors have urgency fatigue. Um, and we can't just keep saying this is an emergency, we have to keep the doors open. And, you know, even though our urgency is still there, um, people want hope, people want to see the good stories, and people want to um, recognize the gratitude that we're feeling. And so that was how we approached our Christmas campaign with absolute gratitude. Um, not only as a strategy, but because we honestly are extremely grateful um, for all of these people that stepped up. It's, it's just incredible what people did. And so going into, um, as we're going into 2021 and approaching our, what would have been the, um, the time of the fundraising gala, we are, we're having conversations and saying, well, you know, we can't just not do something. Um, we have to just go forward and and uh, just put on an event in whatever way we can. We discussed not having an event, um, but ultimately, you know, I think it's it's really important as a way to stay engaged with our donors. Um, so we've decided to go ahead with a virtual gala. And um, we've heard conflicting reports from other people who have done them. Some say they worked out great and some say they were, you know, terrible and didn't make any money. And, uh, but we've decided, you know, even if our fundraising is tempered, um, in staying engaged with our donors in this way and having them see that we're, we're doing something um, is, is really important. So we're going to try and make it a fun and special event. Greg, I think when we were talking the other day, you mentioned something about having charcuterie delivered to people's mm -hmm. houses. And uh, we're, we're considering that as one of our ideas. So yeah. 
Yeah, that I, I'm, and I'm going to go back and I'd like you to explain a little bit more about what you did at Christmas, but I'll just finish up on, you started, uh, brought up the charcuterie idea. I'm, I'm involved with Jazz YYC here in Calgary in, in the arts program and got involved because my son decided to become a jazz musician instead of a medical doctor that his mother wanted him to be. And uh, I need to learn something about it. But what they did for their top supporters was quite exciting. And uh, they delivered a nice cheese and charcuterie board and a bottle of wine again, uh, and uh, put on a virtual concert uh, geared for that event, hired musicians to put that on. And, and it brought that um, intimacy back in as well as a sense of gratitude for their key supporters. Now you did something at Christmas and I think you, you maybe glossed over a little bit, but I think what you told me about on how you engaged your people over the Christmas time was magic and, and how meaningful that was to both the people involved as well as the people receiving the gratitude. Could you, do you wanna share a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to talk more about that. Um, so this Christmas, um, again, we were, as I said, we were trying to approach it from um, a stance of gratitude and just thank those people who have, who not only who helped us um, through COVID, but who helped us through the previous Christmas season, um, because um, our, uh, our donations go to help the families who are in treatment and treatment typically lasts about 10 months. Um, so the people who were helped last year are the people who now this year um, are grateful for um, having been helped in that way. So um, we had a few of our families um, write letters of gratitude to our top donors, um, just saying, you know, not asking for anything, just saying thank you so much for helping my family during this, during probably the worst time of our lives. Um, and, um, and our, our friends that supported us through COVID, um, a lot of times those were the same people that supported during COVID and who had supported during the last Christmas season. So, um, we added a note of gratitude to that where it was appropriate. Um, we, uh, we have, um, one of our graduate families, um, produces coffee. So we had these little bags of coffee. Um, nicely packaged up Christmas cards and we weren't quite sure how this was going to go over we thought okay like it's it's COVID um, should we just mail these and we talked about it a lot and we thought you know what um, let's try our, our first impulse which is to have um, one of our younger staff members and one of our clients go out to these people's homes and just say thank you in person. And they, of course, wearing masks, they distanced and everything at the doors. Um, we were a little bit scared that, uh, you know, it wouldn't go over well, but we decided to do it. And I'm so thankful that we did because what we found was that um, the donors were just so happy to see these kids come to their door and um, just so, so grateful for that human connection. Um, people are just starved to have that. And uh, it, was, it was a really positive experience for the kids and um, a positive experience for our donors. And I'm, uh, I'm really glad that we, we went with our guts and, and ended up doing that. Well, I mean, it just speaks to the emotional connection that's made in those moments and through you know the processes that your organization provides to the families. So uh, I, I, that's one um, I, I take to my heart and, and we'll share time and time again with the people we get to talk to and touch because it is a great way to, to nurture that relationship you have with your core donors and could be extrapolated into so many different things. If, if you have a, you know, we talked about this a little bit as well. We we're talking about, you know, since much of your funding came from individuals stepping up and your event processes rather than you know from from uh, grant writing and other sources as much um since much of your funding comes from that what are, what are you thinking about now in the concept of diversifying how you do your fundraising or what do you what's coming up for you now if you could wave a magic wand what what would work for you 
<laughs> well, we have um, we have been accessing a lot of the COVID-19 relief programs that have been put out and um, we've been very grateful for those as well. Um, so um, yeah, definitely um, diversifying in that area is valuable to us. Um, we're going to see how this online event goes. Um, going forward, I, um, I'm, I'm sure we're all, you know, very anxious for in-person events to return, but maybe there is a space to have online engagement as well um, for people who live far away or can't participate in person for whatever reason. So I hope that does continue going forward. Um, there's also an opportunity for um, crowdfunding as well, um, which is an area we haven't explored too much. We have been exploring a little bit more peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns um, where our, uh, our population is um, engaging with their contacts and their family and friends um, and just getting those, those small donations and those little moments of support that um, is important to them as well. Um, again, that human connection with, uh, mm -hmm. with their family and friends, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of our, um, our supporters who like to step up for us are people who have personal stories with our organization and they want to share those stories and encourage other people to share theirs as well. That's terrific. Um, and, you know, and I think there's some people listening today that might have had more experience with the crowdfunding you know, experience and their pros and cons and how you might be able to be more effective. Maybe they would reach out and share some of that with you. Uh, yeah, that, that would be, that would be a, that would be terrific. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we keep finding in our discussions with people is the willingness today of rethinking their mortality and rethinking, uh, you know, how fortunate they are to be on this planet and recognizing, because they have a lot of time to think about that, recognizing they may have not dotted their I's or cross their T's on all of their documentations and their long-term planning and um, mortality uh, sort of coming up in our faces, creating uh, a change. We're seeing, used to be about 40% of the population that we would talk to uh, in processes would be interested in updating their estate planning and so on. And we're seeing numbers now closer to 60% of people are considering doing that during this time. Um, which creates a bit of an opportunity for long-term planning for your organization. Have you given much thought to, to um, what, what would work for you on, on the plan giving side of, since we have a plan giving audience here primarily, on the plan giving side of your business? What are you, what are you thinking about that as a pillar to, to, uh, to focus on as, as you go forward? I definitely think that's gonna be an important part of our strategy going forward. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we've talked about as an organization for um, quite a while. And uh, it's something that, you know, always seems to um, get pushed aside for more urgent matters. Yeah. But uh, I do think it's important. And I do like your approach of the, um, the donor motivation program being donor centric, uh, because that's a conversation that we had at our uh, at our organization for, for some time was, well, how the heck do we approach this conversation? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I like the idea of, um, you know, making it about the donor, not about, hey, the organization needs money. Exactly. And it's much like what you were saying in your Christmas greeting to your clients. It's about the donor. It's a way of giving gratitude and giving back to them. But there's so many ways to, to do these things. It's just the, the important part about this is many organizations who have focused primarily on their short term event fundraising or their immediate needs and last year brought that right to a forefront. Um, it, it, it's kind of um, in my estimation, it's kind of opened up a little bit of a, uh, 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 the cupboard and you look in the cupboard and say, you know, we're maybe missing this part of the thing. And it's something, what can we do to try and ensure that we are forefront in the legacy planning of our, of our supporters. And maybe uh, if they love us now, maybe they'll love us as they go as well. And, um, and I think, I think that's a valuable discussion is being had, not just in your boardrooms, uh, right across the country. And, and uh, um, it's important to keep the, the charge going, however you choose to implement it when the time comes. Um, that's terrific. 
you know, it's a, it's an interesting, interesting thing. Now, um, you said you were doing some, um, earlier, you were talking a little bit about uh, peer to peer fundraising, which is again on this, this crowdfunding. Um, and you're starting to set up pages with people they're having their sent pages now some of the larger charities have been doing this for some time what's your experience been so far since you've started doing that um it's we've done the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising during our christmas campaign for this was our second year doing it mm -hmm. and um we did it through the canada helps program um and uh, it's it's been a very positive experience um we are you know, we'd like to see more engagement from our population on setting up these pages. Um, basically, how it works is uh, you reach out to your um, your population um, and ask them to set up a personal fundraising page where they can tell their personal story and um, solicit donations, sort of similar to a walkathon or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we we definitely. The first year we did it, we saw um, a, a nice engagement and um, the second year we did it, we've seen more. So I think it's one of those things that once the ball starts rolling, um, we'll see more and more as the years go by, as people get used to it. Yeah, it, it, you know, I think it's, uh, it's necessary to uh, make sure those things, but I think, you know, we, the important part and the theme I think that we brought up today more than anything it's really about your personal relationships you having with your supporters mm -hmm. and and naturally the graduates from your program the you know the the people that have, have benefited from what you've delivered to the table it's it's um it's gratifying and especially in a province you know I, I i got off of the alberta thing a little bit i didn't go there but especially in a province that we have been feeling a little bit under attack as our resource industry has been struggling now for a number of years you know we have a a large uh, uh, drop off in, in economic activity. And, mm -hmm. and uh, ironically, I've been looking at the statistics, although many of the major players, the oil companies and the like, and the support companies are reducing much of their contributions this year and are scaling backwards because their revenue just isn't there. Um, it's gratifying to me to see that the numbers donated to charities in Alberta really haven't dropped off significantly. They've it's because the people, the people that care about the community have been stepping up and standing up. And I think it behooves us as, as, as working with the not-for-profits to, to understand that need and understand that willingness of the public to, to step up and support us when we need it and not to be afraid to have those conversations and everything you do virtually, door-to-door uh, -door at, the, at the front steps or around a campfire uh, leads towards you know, leads towards uh, uh, nurturing the relationships and encouraging the support that those so desperately needed by uh, by our communities for all of the various not-for-profits that are online here today. So I think we're getting close to the end of our time. And uh, my 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 campfire, I had my fireplace behind me, and it's on a thermostat, and it never turned on. So so much for sharing flames with you all. But uh, I hope you feel the flames uh, of warmth that come from Anna and what she's been doing for her with her organization and from myself and the donor motivation program, we really honor the opportunity to bring these things to you. And we honor the fact that you've taken a few minutes of your time out of your day to, to, uh, to join us and listen to stories because we learn from stories. It's a fabulous thing. And Anna, I want to thank you for joining us today and, uh, important thing the uh, recipes for our campfire chat drinks are going we are on the website so please check it out when you're finished and uh, i'm going to enjoy mine when i'm done i've been talking too much so um anna thank you very much and uh thank you so much for having me it's been a terrific pleasure my pleasure um we do have another campfire chat coming and this is going to be a good one with janine purvis and malcolm burrows uh, and that is going to be on February 25th at 11 o'clock Eastern, so 9 o'clock Calgary, another time to bring out an early morning cocktail or something and, uh, and uh, learn some more things about what's going, for, uh, what's going on in the future. Uh, we can only stress one thing here. Thank you very much for attending. 
keep well, keep safe, and keep doing what you do. Canada and our communities really do need it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Anna, for, for joining me today. Thank you. Bye.